Okay, um, still one minute early, but it looks like we've got a full enough room here, so we might as well get started. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I hope everyone's having a, a great Ignite so far. Uh, my name is Richard Lander. I'm a program manager on the .NET team at Microsoft. I work on .NET Core, .NET Framework, and pretty much all the .NET products that we um, ship from Microsoft. Um, and today, as you can see, we're going to talk about cross-platform .NET Core, which is our newest entry in the .NET family, and um, definitely has some different characteristics um, from what we shipped before. So let's, let's learn about that. So I often like to start um, my talks with just kind of um, getting a little bit more context and also looking at some of the highlights that we've had over the last period. Some of you will know all about these. Um, other folks who are kind of new to this area will not. So I've just got four or five things to cover. One is uh, the obvious one, which is we shipped .NET Core 1.0 and ASP.NET Core 1.0 in the June timeframe. Um, I know some of you have uh, probably been following us for a while. Uh, it's definitely been a journey. Um, I think we worked on it for give or take two years. And um, we're really excited that it's done. I know there were a bunch of customers um, that really wanted us to get it out. A bunch of folks actually made big, important bets on us. Uh, and so they're really wanting us to ship. Some folks actually couldn't wait and went live in production on both as, as early as RC1. So anyway, we're, we're really glad to have shipped that. We actually shipped um, our first update to that, I think last week, um, which is 1.0.1. .1. So we are starting kind of an update cycle. Um, we'll have kind of more news on exactly what the cadence of that will look like, but definitely expect a bunch more updates on this product. Uh, another one is um, about two years ago, um, we uh, created this thing called the .NET Foundation. It was uh, around the same time that we announced the open source of .NET Core. And at the time, it wasn't you know, entirely clear to everyone, maybe also including us, exactly what this thing was going to be. Uh, we wanted it to be our, our kind of non-corporate home um, in open source land. And um, more recently, um, a few other companies have come out of the woodwork and said, you know, um, turns out .NET is really important to our businesses uh, and certainly to our customers. And um, we want to get a little bit closer here. And so we actually have created something called a technical steering group that these companies have joined. And we, we work with them. We kind of tell them about our plans, and they give us feedback. Um, we're kind of still early days on that, but it's, it's been working out. I think, you know, so the, the main thing to take away is that there's a bunch of other companies. You'll recognize some of these um, who think .NET is really, really important. I'll just call out one of them, which is Red Hat. Um, so Red Hat came to us and said uh, two things. One is we want Red Hat to work super well on Azure, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, commonly called RHEL. And also that .NET Core thing that you're working on, we want to make sure that works really well on RHEL as well, kind of as two certainly related but uh, separate projects. Um, so on my team, we've been naturally working with them more on the second project, making .NET Core work well. Um, there's a bunch of folks out in the, in the RHEL community that have started to use .NET Core. It's available in the Red Hat software collections. And so that's a, another um, exciting um, process. Quite different. Um, so performance has always been something that's important to us. Um, there's this benchmark called Tech Empower. That's uh, an industry benchmark. We've known about it for a long time. Uh, we've made changes to... Um, the existing ASP.NET and .NET Framework pro product to do better on Tech Empower. It's, it's mostly oriented around Linux. So as we had ASP.NET Core and .NET Core, which is a Linux-oriented product, it kind of gave us um, you know, more emphasis to put a little more attention to the Tech Empower benchmark. And we're now one of the leading frameworks from a performance perspective here. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that's exciting. Two more points. Um, one is you may have heard us talk about .NET Standard. It's more or less our portable class libraries replacement. Um, it has some different characteristics than PCL, which is why we um, felt a need to build something new. Um, it, it really became live. It's, it's distinct from .NET Core, but it really kind of shipped, if you will, at the same time as .NET Core. 
And so we now have about 1,800 libraries on NuGet.org, um, public release libraries. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we expect, you know, a year from now, we'll have a great number more than that. Um, so that's good. And last one, this one's kind of a vanity metric. I'll definitely admit to that. So I, I don't really care about the highest aspect of it. It's more the fact that um, when we started doing open source, I think a bunch of folks were, you know, uh, not suspicious, um, you know, wondering what that what Microsoft was going to be like as an open source company. And um, I, I won't suggest that we're doing everything perfect, but I think we've kind of definitely come to the table and shown that we can be a credible company and do a bunch of good things in open source land on GitHub. A bunch of the people that we work with on a daily basis seem to be super happy with the experience working with us. And um, I, I'm, I'm personally proud of that because um, I put a lot of energy into the, um, our open source engagement. Okay, enough of that. So let's kind of start to look into the actual topic. What I'm going to do is I first kind of got a, um, a more high level primer. It's about five slides long. And then we're going to go uh, deeper into some details to give you some idea of how the mechanisms work. And then we're going to do demos. So we often start with um, this particular slide in our slide decks. I'm not going to explain every box. Um, this is just to contextualize what we're talking about. Um, so you're, you're probably familiar with Dynamic Framework. That's our developer product for Windows. We're not talking about that today. Uh, and then we have Xamarin, which is our .NET product for targeting mobile, iOS and Android. You may have heard that we recently acquired Xamarin, so they're definitely a key part of the Microsoft family now. Also not talking about that today. So we're going to focus in on .NET Core. So this is our solution for cross-platform uh, services, websites, um, console apps, and tools. So we'll just start with um, what are kind of the key value propositions or selling points of .NET Core. If you were to have to go back to your place of work and you know, give the elevator pitch to you know, your management, th these would kind of be the, the four reasons. Um, so the first one is obviously cross-platform. There's more flexibility in the places you can use it. Um, that one's pretty obvious. Um, I like to tell a, a quick story on this point, which is when we first started the Azure project, it was um, targeted towards Windows. And then eventually we started supporting Linux VMs. And then eventually um, we had customers coming to us who had a heterogeneous environments and they would bring both Windows and Linux VMs. And the, the leadership of those companies would come to us and say, oh, you know, I've got this heterogeneous environment of Linux and Windows, but I also have this heterogeneous environment of developers back home at, at my company. And I wish Microsoft would give me some suggestion on how to make that more uniform. And they say, you know, we know you have this developer division, which is actually where I work, and maybe they could give us a solution, but we didn't really have a good cross-platform solution that had great support in Visual Studio, great support in Azure. And so we decided, you know, .NET is our premier development platform for Microsoft and for Windows. How about we make that cross-platform? We'll be able to have an offering for these customers that have heterogeneous environments. We don't expect that, you know, every single person is going to go to their kind of Linux-oriented developer and say, like, oh, okay, here's the solution for you. Please stop developing on what you're developing. But we think it's a great option for people who, who um, want to have a more uniform experience in their company. Fast, uh, I talked about the tech and power thing. We have some incredible numbers to share. Um, our, our numbers in our labs say that we're eight times faster than Node.js for the particular benchmarks that we've been looking at, and three times faster than Go. Um, some of these platforms have incredible reputations in the industry, and we're certainly not questioning those. So some of you might be a little bit surprised um, that for such an early product, like Dynacore is definitely an ASP Dynacore, our 1Os, that we're coming out of the gate um, so strong. I mean, what this really is, is that we've built up uh, a, pretty, a pretty great team over the years uh, uh, for the .NET and ASP.NET teams, and we've applied some great people to performance, and we continue to, we plan to continue with that. Lightweight, 
Lightweight is a couple different things at once. Um, one of them is that we've built a modular platform. So um, if you build an app, you only have to take as much .NET with you onto your machine as you want, as what's required by the app. So that's a good thing. Um, another one is that uh, you, um, the dot, .NET doesn't come with the operating system. So um, you can install any number of versions that you want. So it's very side by sideable And it's also aligned super well with the new container model. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I think we covered the open source thing. Uh, the platform's open source from top to bottom. There's a certain segment of folks in the industry that only use open source platforms. So that's now uh, a new set of additional customers that's available to us. So um, some of those are adopting .NET Core. So we think that's really exciting. OK, so we'll talk about the Tech Empower thing. Um, there's several benchmarks from Tech Empower. One of them is called plain text. Um, it's, it is what it sounds like. It's a very simple benchmark where you just return plain text from the web server. You don't return HTML. It's not a web service. Um, so this is kind of your entry point into the Tech Empower benchmarks. And the one thing you'll find when you start looking at this kind of thing is they're extremely hardware dependent. Um, so you'll get very different numbers on different machines. This machine, as you can see at the bottom, had 48 logical processors and almost 200 gigs of memory, which is a pretty beefy machine by most standards. And you can see here that we were doing just over 5 million requests per second um, with ASP.NET Core and Windows. And then you can kind of see the, the other numbers for the other frameworks. So don't expect to replicate this um, benchmark on your laptop. You'd have to use a similar piece of hardware. But the ratios um, should actually remain relatively constant. Um, we have another success story, which is uh, there's this um, company that we've been working with, and they have a game called Age of Ascents. Uh, it's one of those big multiplayer games where most of the state is stored on the server, uh, and the clients then just kind of interact with that server, server data. And you can see that going back to um, November 2015, October, almost a year ago, um, that they were in kind of the 400K requests per second. Again, these, these numbers don't match the other numbers because it's different hardware. Um, and then you can see that they slightly more than almost tripled um, that in the course of a few months. And this one's interesting for two different reasons. One is that that's a very nice increase in performance in a short time. And the other one is um, this guy, his name's Ben Adams actually, who works for this company. He made about half the changes in our open source product that, that led to this improvement. So we worked together um, and collaborated, and this is the result. Uh, and we've done this in, in other places as well. So that's a, a really great outcome that wouldn't have happened before. OK, now we're going to shift to some concepts um, so that you get your footing on kind of what .NET Core is and what it delivers. So if you had been following Azure, this is kind of a, just I'm using this as an analogy. We had web roles and worker roles. Um, that's kind of what this is, is we have two workloads that we support. One is web and one is console. So web is websites and web services. Um, eventually, SignalR will be there as well. And then the other one is kind of our foundational technology, which is console apps. Um, so you would use that for batch processing, for tools, um, anything like that. So if the IRS wanted to run um, a background task to crunch through taxes to see if I'm cheating on mine, they would write a console app. Um, and it turns out, actually, the way we've built our platform, ASP.NET web apps are actually console apps. So everything is a console app. In the ASP.NET days, uh, sorry, like uh, on ASP.NET on .NET Framework, web apps were a hosted model by IIS, and we've switched so that everything is a console app. Um, and it's actually much simpler, simpler and has some key advantages. OK, so th this one's actually fairly important. It's one of the, the most key aspects of the whole platform. And by the way, it's OK if people ask questions. Um, I, have a little, I have more material here than I'll probably be able to present. So if people ask questions, then I'll know kind of which piece of material to poke on as we get a little further. Anyway, so we have two models. One is shared. Uh, we, we also colloquially call this one framework dependent. And this is the default, the default model. 
It's the most similar to .NET Framework on Windows. Um, the idea here is that you install .NET Core centrally on your machine. Unlike .NET Framework, you can have as many versions as you want. You can have stable, multiple stable versions. You can also have some nightly, nightly versions that you picked off of our open dev feed. Um, but the key point is that they're in the shared location. The apps that participate in the shared model, they only contain um, the app itself. And so then they rely on this .NET Core that lives in a shared location. This model is really good for a few different scenarios. One, it's great for development time. You know, um, the idea here is you want to be moving as few DLLs to your bin folder as possible. So if they just stay in the shared, the, 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 the .NET Core framework, if it just stays in, this, stays in the shared location, that's the best option. The other case is for server hosting density. So if you want to host as many web .NET Core websites on a machine as possible, then you want just one central copy of .NET Core, and then all those um, apps rely on that, that one version, and it's only loaded once into memory. So that, that one. And then the last one is around kind of servicing and control. Uh, if you have just one version of .NET Core, then you can just update that one version, and you can kind of have some control over it. So that's the shared model. Self-contained is something we've really never had um, with .NET. The idea here is that you can publish your app to a directory. I mean, you can zip it up if you would like. Uh, and then everything, all the .NETness, is contained in that one directory. So you can copy that directory to another machine, has an exe in it, and then you call that exe, and it launches the app. It does not expect a shared installation of .NET Core in that machine. In, fa in fact, if there is one, it won't even use it. Uh, it is entirely self-contained. And so we think this is a great model. You know, if you're, um, if you're just trying to take a single .NET Core app to a machine and you don't expect any others to be there, then there's kind of no sharing benefits, so you might as well go self-contained. Another one is if you build tools and you just want to X copy down a .NET tool to your machine and just run it and then delete it, then self-contained is the best for that. So anyway, these are our two deployment models. Um, like I said, shared is the default, and you opt in to self-contained. Another part of this is isolation. So by default, you kind of have a bare metal experience. That isn't even necessarily the right term, but hopefully it kind of sends the right message, which is that .NET Core and all the related files you know, just get installed onto your machine um, or into a virtual machine, and you just use them. Um, there's no isolation from... Um, anything else in an operating system sense. But we also have a container story. So we have um, Docker images uh, up on Docker Hub, um, and you can go use them today. We've had Linux-oriented images now for maybe a year. Um, the Windows images just came out as part of this conference because, um, as you may have heard, the Windows team um, is now doing Docker for both Server Core and Nano. So naturally, we couldn't do that before them. So the, the Windows part of it is still not 100% there for us. We, um, the images just kind of showed up recently. We're working furiously on them right now to kind of make them basically perfect. I expect by the end of the week, they should be pretty good. Uh, we do have um, Server Core and Nano images on Docker Hub right now, but they're kind of a bit wonky just because of the, the, the Windows pushing up there. So, in the next couple of days, I think they'll be good to use. Okay, so I often get asked differences between .NET Core and .NET Framework. So I've split this into similarities and differences. One could kind of think of this also as familiar aspects as well as separate value props. So I'll just go through them. Uh, both implement the .NET Standard API. We uh, announced .NET Standard 2.0 on our blog, uh, Monday, on Monday, two days ago. Um, .NET Framework 4.6.1 and, and up actually support .NET Standard 2.0 already, uh, and we expect .NET Core to support it um, early next year. It's a bunch of work for us to do to, to get there, to add a bunch of um, APIs. That'll make many people very happy. Um, both support ASP.NET Core and EF Core. Intuitively, you might think these other two core products only work on .NET Core. That is not true. They both they, they work in both places. 
best experience for development is in Visual Studio. We've always put a lot of effort into making sure that there's a great experience for .NET Framework in Visual Studio. We're doing that for .NET Core 2. There's a great experience in Visual Studio Code. It's the only experience, um, at least from Microsoft, on Mac and Linux, um, and you can also use it on Windows. As I said, we have a Docker story. Um, .NET Framework also has a Docker story as of this week. Um, I'm not talking about that in this um, presentation, but I thought I'd mention it. So that one only works on server core. Um, uh, .NET Core works on nano and server core for, for Docker, Windows Docker images. And both support the latest C Sharp. So the C Sharp team, you know, they're working on C Sharp 7 right now. It'll support .NET Framework and .NET Core at the same time. Differences. .NET Core comes with, sorry, .NET Framework comes with Windows. Uh, .NET Core doesn't come with any operating system. It comes on top when you put it there. Uh, .NET Framework supports F Sharp and VB. Those are still coming for Core. We're working quite a lot with F Sharp and VD, VB teams on that. Uh, .NET Core is cross-platform and open source. As I said, .NET Core works on Nano. Um, this, this one's a key one. S some of you won't care about this, but uh, .NET Core has a really strong command line experience. This is something we built in from the start. Now, .NET Framework has a ton of tools for it, both that come with Windows and that are part of the .NET Framework SDK. But there's kind of no like uniform, strong principle that kind of make them all work well together. .NET Core has something, it, it does have that. There's this tool called .NET, which I'll show you, that enables you to use all these tools together. It's, it's really quite a pleasant experience. And last, .NET Core supports side-by-side -side installs by default. So these are the key differences. Okay, so that was kind of the, the quick plane ride over the landscape. So now we're gonna drop to what I call the 100 meter view and start to get some more details and then we'll go into some demos. So th this part, this, this slide is not revolutionary in any sense. Um, th uh, most um, development platforms have this kind of idea where we have source code plus a project file and so .NET Core has this too. So what I'm gonna do now is show you what so the source code and the project files look like. I think some of you probably know we have this project.json to csproj transition going on. So we're gonna see some of that as well. And I'll, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. So this is the most um, you know, simple, basic um, .NET Core application you can have. Um, I think everyone knows what this does. It's our, it's our hello world. It's the exact same code that you would run on .NET Framework. So no changes. Um, just because I wanted to be cute, um, I C Sharp six eyes to this particular example. This actually has nothing to do with .NET Core in particular, um, but I at least thought someone in the audience would appreciate this. Um, okay, so let's start to look at the project file. So this is the most simple project.json file. This is the current project file for .NET Core. As you can see, it's in, in JSON format. And so I've, I've annotated these files to kind of call out the most interesting parts. Um, so this is a library, um, it's, a, it's going to, it both depends on and is going to produce a .NET standard library. This first line is um, a NuGet dependency to a meta package. This meta package brings in all the reference assemblies that the compiler is going to use to make sure you color within the lines of the available API. Uh, you always use, or you're um, encouraged to use the latest version of the meta package. Um, be, uh, and the, the latest version exposes all, uh, all, the, t all the versions of, this, this part's a little hard to explain. Uh, it exposes the reference assemblies for all .NET standard versions. So it's, it's, it's very meta. Um, this in this particular case, I want to build a .NET standard 1.4 library. So this is my target framework. If you've used .NET framework for a while, you know that we have this target framework concept, so I'm building a .NET standard 1.4 library, and I just happen to use this version of the meta package to get the reference assemblies. Here's a project.json file for an app, again, annotated. So the first version is just the version of what you're building. It's your version number, it has nothing to do with .NET Core version numbers. Um, this part's a little niche, but I thought 
um, deserve to be discussed. Um, we've had PDBs since the, since the start with .NET Framework, so you can have a debugging experience. Windows PDBs do not work on Linux and Mac, so we had to invent um, a new um, PDB format. Xamarin actually had a similar need, so we actually worked with them a couple of years ago to build this. So it's a different type of PDB. It is supported by Visual Studio, but I expected some of you would want to know what that was all about. Now we get down to frameworks. So this, this is an app. It targets .NET Core. So its target framework is Net, Net Core App 1.0. Uh, it also needs a meta package to get both um, the reference assemblies and the, then eventually the implementation. So that's what this is. The version of that is 1.0.1, .1, which is the latest version uh, that's available. Now we get into something kind of a little bit wonky, this type equals platform. This is actually the directive in the project.json file that says, I want to be in shared mode. Um, and then if you didn't want, if you wanted to be in self-contained, you would delete this line. So that's basically our way of you pivoting which one to be in. Um, this is actually something we're not 100% happy with, um, and the reason is very simple. Uh, so this is something we're fixing. Um, so right now, if you wanted to have an app that sometimes is shared and sometimes is standalone or self-contained, you have to have two different project.json files, which is a massive pain and they can't be in the same directory. Um, so we really want this, this whole notion to be a publish time um, concern so that you can publish an app in different, in different ways. That would be much better, so that will, that will definitely be coming, but that's, that's the current situation. The last thing is there are other TFMs that, sorry, assemblies built that target other target frameworks um, that are not um, by default compatible with .NET Core. We have this import statement which says, oh, there's this thing called DNX Core 50. In this case, it's just um, a target framework from um, an earlier version of .NET Core from our RCs. And so there are some um, NuGet packages that are still built with that, so you have to say, I import this target framework and I say that it's compatible with .NET Core. Another thing I wish was by default, but it's something that has to be done manually. Another thing we're looking at fixing. Okay, so I think some of you have heard that we're moving to CS Proj. Um, this is the existing Visual Studio um, format for projects. Uh, we're moving to this for one major reason, which is, um, uh, Visual Studio already supports this, and we never could build a good project-to-project -project linking story between .NET Core and other projects. Um, so that's the thing that motivated us to go back to this. Some people in the community are unhappy about this because the project.json format that you just saw is, so, is much more compact than this. Um, a bunch of people hate XML. Um, we, we, those, those, those reasons resonate with us, um, but we just couldn't build a good experience with project.json and Visual Studio. We tried extremely hard. We actually probably spent too much time trying that. Um, so we're going back to this because we know we can do it. We've actually made a bunch of improvements to CS Proj so that it is more compact. One of the key things that people really dislike about CS Proj that we fixed is the thing in yellow, which is Typically, you had to have all your files listed, um, and then if you ever added or removed files, it was horrible for source control diffing. We've added this new directive, which includes all the CS files, which project.json already has by default. You don't even need this line in project.json, so we think that's a major improvement. If you look at the, the pieces in green, I didn't annotate them, but I marked them, you can see that this is the same information that was in the project.json that we just saw. So it's, it's very, very similar. So uh, I think people will eventually accept this. It, at the end of the day, it's mostly XML versus JSON. So when's it going back to CSProj? Excellent question. So um, we have a release coming this year that will come with, um, uh, at the same time as Visual Studio 15, not to be confused with Visual Studio 2015. Uh, yeah, um, horrible, horrible names. <laughs> Uh, I did not choose those. Uh, yeah, so our, our release product goes with years, like the whole year, and then our, the, our products when they're in release goes with the number, like meaning it is the 15th version 
and they just happened to collide. It's very unfortunate. It's because they mostly started in year 2000, so very bad plan. Um, anyway, there'll be a version of um, .NET Core um, at the, near the end of the year when the, the RC is available, um, where this, this tooling will be in place. Uh, and then next, next year when um, Visual Studio 15 ships, then this will be the model that everyone will be using. So no one will be required to move to this this year. Next year is when people will start migrating their projects from project.json to csproj, and there will be tooling um, that we've already built that m automatically migrates the project formats. Is it going to be an upgrade from a project, or is it going to continue to work as project.json? Excellent question. So the project.json tooling will stay in Visual Studio 2015. We're not bringing that to, Visual, to the new one. Um, so that, that'll be a big bif bifurcation. So if you want to stay with project.json, you have to stay with Visual Studio 2015, and that'll eventually not be supported. We're, we're only going to have one supported story, which is csproj, and that's why there's only one in the new version of Visual Studio. So will I be able to open the csproj in 2015? No. Okay. No, it's, it's, a ma it's a very, very coarse line between them. So not everyone's going to be happy about that. Um, it would have been a tr tremendous amount of work for us to do something different. Uh, so we think this is the best, the best choice. Okay, so we looked at the assets. What do you do with them? So the two things you need are your assets and then the .NET Core SDK. Um, if you're using Visual Studio, you install a different tools bundle, and the .NET Core SDK comes with it. And I'll show you how to get those. So one key, once you've built your app, one key thing to note is there are no Xs in this model. I said everything's a console app, but, um, well, actually, self-contained apps have Xs, um, but shared ones do not. Those um, have to be hosted uh, by a tool. Many other dev platforms have this exact same model where you run something and then pass the path to your app after that. Um, you know, we've had Xs on Windows for 15 years now with .NET Framework. The reason we were able to build that is because we were part of the operating system. So there is actually code in the OS loader in Windows that knows about .NET um, assemblies and knows to load the CLR at the right point in order for .NET Xs to work. Um, we could, we could have built that again in Windows. Uh, we didn't think it was the right decision. We knew we could not do that on Mac and Linux, so we built a uniform system across everything, which is why we have this model. Okay, so let's look at the command line usage for in the .NET Core SDK. Uh, as I said before, we have this kind of unifying tool across everything. It's called .NET, as you can see. There's more commands than this, but I thought we would just take a quick run through the the ones you would use every single day. So .NET new actually creates the files you just saw. Um, so when you type that, you get some starter files that are runnable um, and that you can edit in a text editor and you're kind of off to the races from there. .NET restore restores the package references that you have today in your project JSON, tomorrow that you'll have in CSproj. .NET build builds your source assets into DLLs and puts them into a bin directory and then .NET path to your app DLL loads and runs your app. Awesome. .NET run is a convenience wrapper over the last two commands. So you find yourself just using .NET run a lot because um, while well, .NET build and path to your DLL are fine, they're kind of a pain. So most of us just use .NET run all the time. Okay. So some people don't like command line. Command line is 100% optional. We think it's awesome. Um, but we have great experiences in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, and you're definitely encouraged to use those. I would say we're putting, yeah, we're putting a ton of effort into those. Uh, so we, we hope a bunch of people do use them. OK, so let's, let's move to some demos. I think we've gotten, um, gotten our, our, ourselves situated. Does anyone have any questions before I move on? Like, there's something about what we've discussed that still isn't quite clicking before I move. 
OK. So let's leave PowerPoint. Um, first, oh, I had my browser open. Um, so what I want to do first is just show you where to get some of this stuff. So if you go to dot, dot, dot net dot slash core, awesome URL, um, you'll go to kind of our, our marketing site. It's kind of how we refer to it. And you'll see that um, it contextualizes you to the operating system. So if you're on Windows, um, it allows you to install. You can install the SDK, which is this thing down here. Um, or you can install the Visual Studio tooling, which includes the SDK. You do need Visual Studio 2015 Update 3 in order to use any of this stuff in Visual Studio. That's, that's the thing we support. And then we have experiences on Mac. Um, we have a PKG installer there. And then on Linux, we support several Linuxes uh, and mostly use package managers to install there. And then we have a Docker story as well. Um, and I just wanted to show you one other thing while we're still in the browser um, down here. So if you're kind of wanting to get started, um, so we have github.com slash .net slash core. And we have some samples in here. Um, this .NET bot sample is the one we're actually going to be playing with the most. Uh, you can see it has a Docker file there. And so if you want to do some of this at home, that's the, a, a decent place to start. OK. So let's start with the, the big app. Let's start with Visual Studio. So this is Visual Studio 2015, update 3. And so this experience uh, is very, um, ah, should seem very, I have used this product before. Um, OK, so we have a .NET Core node uh, here. We've got three different project types here. Class library, console app, and ASP.NET app. We're, we're going to look at, I think we'll just look, we'll start with console. So we're not going to do like some massive um, amount of development here. Really, I'm just trying to get you, you folks to the point that you understand what's going on. You understand how to find things. You understand the mechanisms. Um, I'm kind of assuming that um, if you want to write an app, you know how to do that part. So this is very similar. Um, so we're just going to see, you know, we have IntelliSense and everything. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the, the usual stuff. So, and I'm just demonstrating that um, everything works as you would expect. You can't, when you're in Visual Studio, you can't even really tell that you're using .NET Core. The only thing that makes it, oops, that's the wrong window. It's this one. The other thing that makes it obvious, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but yeah, I don't know how to make the title bar itself bigger. Um, you can see that the app being run is in C program file slash dot net slash dot net dot exe. So that's that host launcher that I talked about. So dot net exe, one thing I should pause on for just a moment, it actually doesn't implement all of those commands that I told you about before, like dot net new, dot net restore, .NET build, it's really just a launcher. So when you copy that to a machine, um, like you're not bringing the whole SDK with you. The SDK is actually something different. And .NET is just smart enough to know how to find all those tools in the same way that it's smart enough to find this Hello World app. So it really is just this very simple and small launcher. Anyway, so that's really the only way that you would know that this is a .NET Core app. And you can see, I think, People have realized we've kind of gone pretty heavy into NuGet. Oh, I wanted to show you. Here's the project.json file. Um, I can't remember. Oh, well. Uh, Zoom, is that how I do this? Oh, well. I can't remember. Oh. That's a different thing. I don't have a mouse wheel on this is my problem. Otherwise, anyway. Oh, there we go. I tried control plus. It didn't work. There we go. That's better. Um, OK. So I just wanted to show you one thing, which is if we go to managing NuGet packages, uh, go to browse, and we'll just install one. Yes, please do not show this again. 
uh, and then we go back to project.json, you see this got added. So that's kind of the extent of the experience. Um, you can also add packages here as well. Um, yeah, let's, let's see. Oops. System dot, and there's, you know, system dot collections dot async. Uh, yeah, so that is one of the things we've talked about. We actually, um, so currently with CSProj, um, I think you, you know you, you can't have your project open and get at the CSProj text, if you will, at the same time. We actually have um, a new kind of underlying project system that we're working on. Um, I don't work on this, so I actually don't know a ton about it. And um, it will actually enable that scenario that you talked about, having the project open and having the CS project open as text at the same time, and you can edit in either place. So that's a new capability. It has nothing to do with .NET Core, per se, um, but it's a new Visual Studio capability that will be coming to .NET Core first. Excellent question. NuGet is our story everywhere. Um, so when you type .NET Restore on any operating system, it grabs those packages from NuGet. They're the same packages. Uh, in the same way that if you were doing JavaScript development on Windows, NPM would go to, to the NPM store. Uh, well, so you can have, um, the tooling supports different NuGet feeds. It is in no way, um, you're in no way required to use NuGet.org, so you use it by default, but you can turn that off without any trouble. Um, so you could use a, a VSTS, um, like a Visual Studio Online feed. You could use one that was just in your corporate network. You could even just point to a file share on your machine, kind of whatever you want. We do Go ahead. Sure. Is there a bin directory still? Sure. Um, yeah, I can do that. So if we go here, let's um, open folder in File Explorer. So these are the assets. Um, and if we go to bin, debug, netcore app. So this is the way it works is we kind of have one more level here, which is the target framework that you're targeting. Um, here are all the files. So that's your app console app 2.dll, it has a PDB. Depths is just some information about it. Um, the, yeah, and these are, just, these are just various configuration files. But these two files are your app. Um, so a follow-up to that is, is this machine another machine? Do you have to copy the launcher with it, or do you expect the launcher to be on the other machine? Uh, excellent question. Um, yeah, the launcher and the app are actually fairly separate. This kind of goes a little bit back to the um, shared versus self-contained story that we already talked about. So in the default configuration, which is what we're in right now, you actually can see that that type equals platform is there like we, like we looked at before. Yeah, that means I'm in shared mode. I expect .NET Core and the launcher to be installed centrally. Since, since we're talking about it, we might as well just go look at it. Um, it wasn't actually going to do that, um, but I think that it makes sense. So, uh, program files, uh, is it, in, it must be in the other program files. There. So, I wish I knew how to make this bigger. So here we have, that's the launcher, dotnet under the dotnet directory, and then under shared is where we have the product. This is, this is .NET Core here. This is the shared framework, as we call it. So those are all the files that make it up. So in this configuration, if you were just to take this directory and either run it in Visual Studio or VS Code or just from the command line, the expectation is you would have this installed. If you didn't want that and you wanted it to be self-contained, you would have to publish it as a self-contained app. And I can show you how to do that. So, excellent question. So, when we shipped, 
uh, everyone had 1.0.0 there. And then if you got the update, you would additionally have the 1.01 directory that you see. Um, the way it works is we roll forward on the third version number. Um, we consider those to be patches, and we only put um, security updates and super important quality, like reliability updates in there. So you could have an app that was targeting 1.0.0, um, and then it would still run fine. It would, it would run on 1.0.1, just because of our roll forward story. Now, we spent a lot of time discussing this particular issue because uh, not everyone's happy with the roll forward story we have on, with Dynamic Framework on Windows. Um, we have a completely different, since we have this kind of side by, we, yeah, with Windows, we only had one thing to update ever, uh, like with the 4.x um, product. With this one, since we have it side by side, we're just being disciplined on the kind of updates we put in the third version number versus the first and the second. Um, so yeah, these are just patches. Uh, and hopefully that works out. Okay, so that's what I was wanting to show you here. Let's take a quick look at a web app. A bunch of you folks are probably web developers. So it's pretty simple. Just go here, I'm just saying I want a web app. It could be a web service. Get rid of that. Um, just wait till it's done restoring. And press F5. And it should launch. And there we go. Um, web apps, so as I said, let's see if I can find the setting. Uh, I haven't actually looked for this in quite some time. Web apps can run on .NET Framework. Um, hmm. Ah, uh, that would that would not help things. Hmm. I'm actually not sure where that particular setting is. Uh, it must have it must have moved from where I looked at it last time. But there is a way to set .NET Framework versus .NET Core here. Um, maybe, maybe it's in Project JSON. There used to be an actual setting for it. Um, I guess, yeah, you would, I think it would be something different than this. Anyway, let's, not, let's ignore that for the moment. OK, so now I want to show you the other experiences, not Visual Studio. So let's look at Visual Studio Code. This one's um, a little bit different. This one, you can kind of, depending on your lifestyle kind of desires, you can make it kind of a combination of editor plus command line, or you can kind of pivot it more to just pure editor, depending on what it is you want to do. I'm just going to show you how I kind of use it. Um, so. Let's, um, it has a integrated terminal, so you can um, have a separate terminal, like command window if you want, but we're just gonna try and do everything in one place. So control apostrophe is the terminal. So we are going to make a directory, uh, make directory called um, test1. Okay, we're gonna go into test1, and then what we're going to do is we're going to open a folder. So the, the model in VS Code is that you don't start with projects. Its whole notion of the world is through a folder. So everything is rooted into a folder. It doesn't really care about projects because it basically assumes, I don't know what your project is. There's an extension that you'll load that takes care of all that, that whiz-bang stuff. All I care about is the folder. So that's, that's how it works. Um, Test one. Okay, so we're gonna select the folder. It opens. I just wanna show you one more thing. I've already installed this, but if you click on this last button, it lists the extensions. I already have the C-sharp extension installed, um, and you would, you would definitely want that to be installed. It's usually at the top of the list because it's the most popular extension. 
OK, so we don't have any files yet. So we're going to go back to this terminal, and I'm going to type .NET new. The projects show up. And then there's something at the bottom, bottom right. It's a, it's, it has a picture of a little fire, and it says my project. There's this um, open source extension built on top of Roslyn called OmniSharp. It's actually the thing that's providing a, a big part of the experience here. And so sometimes if your root is higher up the tree and you have multiple project.json folders there, then you have to tell, you click on this thing and you tell it which one is the one you want to be working on now. So it just depends on how you want to work. I work both ways, so sometimes I kind of contextualize myself all the way so there's only one choice and then it picks the right one. Other times I'm further up. Depends what you want. OK, so it said you basically just press yes to both of these buttons. The first one says there's required build and debug assets. Do you want them? Of course. And it knows that I haven't run restore yet. So it's running restore on my behalf. You don't have to do that one because you could just do it at the command line. And then I could type .NET run. And you can see it typed hello world there. S separately, I could do this, um, which is .NET bin uh, debug. Oh, VS Code has like some, when you press tab, it does not get happy. Um, net, uh, bin, uh, oops, typed me totally the wrong thing. Um, debug. Net core app 1.0 slash test one dot DLL. So that's how you run it directly. Then there's no tool spew because you're just literally running that app. OK, so we're not even really to the good part yet. Um, so I can set a breakpoint in here. There's this bug icon, which basically means debugging. I click that, and um, I'm going to stop at a breakpoint which is cool. Um, and I'm just going to show you one more thing, just to show you uh, var um, s equals, uh, we're going to use an interpolated string, which is another cool new C sharp 6 feature. And we're going to say the time is, and we're going to do Date time, you can see that we have IntelliSense within the interpolated string, um, which is actually pretty cool. Um, time of day to string, that should do it. And then if we run this and stop at the same point, we stopped. And then we can click down here, we can click S. Um, where, that wasn't what I was expecting. Oh, I did something different, yeah. Uh, it did that. And so, yeah, so everything, everything works um, is the main point. And then if we go over here, uh, sorry, here we do have... Um, a similar um, project.json editing experience. So you can see we'll add Newtonsoft JSON again. Um, you can see that it knows a lot about. Uh, oh, there. That's the one I wanted. So is that what you get, you get, you get I, yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, sorry, um, I was a little bit concentrating on that still. You're saying, what's the add-in? Yeah, uh, oh, well, so the, yeah, the experience is with Visual Studio Code is you type in this file, like I was doing. You need to know the NuGet file you want. It did show the versions there, but it's not, other than just showing the version numbers, it's not giving you a tremendous amount of information. Um, and then when I've added this, um, I go, I save it, and it immediately knows that my 
project.json is now kind of invalid with respect to my last restore. And I can restore directly um, just, to, just to make it interesting. I said no so you can more easily see what happens. I type .NET restore and um, it restored the required additional packages. So that's the two parts of the story. You edit project.json directly and then you restore with .NET restore either directly or let Visual Studio Code do it for you. Yeah, so there's no, there's no UI widget that someone has built that helps you browse NuGet.org. Am I, am I answering the wrong question? Oh, no, the, the C Sharp extension does that. Sorry, if that was the question. The C Sharp extension is giving us this, it's, it's giving us this experience. Um, sorry, I, I misunderstood the question. Yes. Um, yeah, the C Sharp extension gives us IntelliSense. It gives us um, the project.json editing. Um, it's, it's the thing that knows that our project.json is invalid now, like it just showed. Visual Studio Code doesn't know how to do any of that. It knows nothing about .NET. So for the .NET restore, where does it know to get the packages from? From the NuGet feed that you have registered. Okay, so, okay, so you just register that in the project? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the question that was asked earlier, which is um, we register NuGet by default. You can turn that off. You can register what any, whatever NuGet feeds you want, either you know that are on some, you know, on MyGet or some other public like hosted NuGet feed, or with just within your firewall. It, it's all good. Yeah, there is a file. I was, I think it's in the, um, it's in one of the JSON files. I have, I have edited this file before, but I can't actually remember which one it is, uh, to be honest. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a JSON file where you specify your NuGet feeds, um, and then the OmniSharp editor will respect that. Sorry, like the, the v VS Code C Sharp extension will respect that. It's basically built on top of everything, and so it doesn't have any state of its own that knows about particular NuGet feeds. So we know that um, on the .NET team, we know that private NuGet feeds is an important feature for, for everyone, and so, so we're, we're all on board on that. We don't want to break anyone's experience on that. Yeah, it's, it's um, so, yes, yeah, so with Visual Studio, they have a UI experience for specifying feeds. Um, I've never tried to make that work with .NET Core. Um, actually, I, I think it does work. Um, as you can see, this is not exactly my strongest area, but I know the NuGet thing, it does work. Okay, so I just, um, Wanted to, I, th uh, I think I've showed you the basics. Now I want to show you um, how this works with Docker. That is kind of the, the new cool thing. So, yeah, so let's go to my um, .NET bot example. So, okay, core samples. Okay. So I've got this .NET bot example. That's better. There. Um, got this .NET bot example. Um, it's got a really sim simple project.json. And let's just, I probably already did this, but let's just restore it. And then let's .NET run it. And all this does is um, it says, welcome to using .NET Core. And it's a picture of our bot. Uh, I don't know if some of you may be aware of this. We have this cool little person thing called .NET Bot. If you go to github.com slash .NET Bot, 
Uh, it's kind of like our mascot of our open source efforts. So um, we, we like to use it. And so you can also say .NET run, hello, ignite people. And it, it says that. OK. So clearly, we want to go one step further with this. So I created a Docker file. Um, OK, good. I created a Docker file um, just the way I created them. Th this one I had before. So this one's for Linux. Um, this one's for Nano Server, and this one's for Server Core. So we're going to use the um, Nano one today. Um, so there's this icon way on the bottom. So my Docker is running. These are, do these are the new Docker tools for Windows. Um, they were actually currently they were running on Linux containers. So Basically, the way it works with Docker tools for Windows is there's two VMs that are running. One's for Linux and one's for Windows containers. The, the tool, Docker, docker.exe, uh, there's only one tool, so you have to switch which one you want it to talk to. The containers themselves can be running concurrently in the two different VMs, so that's why you have to always switch it back and forth. So Docker will be new for some people. OK, so let's um, go back big again. OK, so what we're going to do, so I have no Docker, con no Docker running currently, containers. Um, let's see what images I have. So I created a bunch before. I'm going to delete the one. So Docker, remove image. Please really do it. Um, this is the one I'm going to recreate. And the nice thing about Docker is it's kind of this layered thing. And so I have all these base images um, already, so it means that these operations are going to be relatively fast because I don't have to go download them from Docker Hub, which is where all, all our images are. So I'm going to say docker build um, minus t, and I, I call this .NET bot nano because that's the one I want to build for. And then minus f is, I have to, since I'm not doing the actual Docker file to say which one I want, and I'm saying the current directory is the scope on which I want you to work. And actually, it's, it's done already. So now I'm going to type docker run um, dot net. Well, actually, let's look at images again. And it's the first one. You can see it was created 13 seconds ago. Dot net bot nano. Yeah. OK, so do I always keep on mixing up .NET and Docker because they both start with D. Um, and they have similar um, commands. Both of them have build and run as verbs. Um, so I'm going to run docker run .NET bot nano. And let's see. It should start. So what this is, is I'm running um, Windows 10 client anniversary update. You need the anniversary update, um, the 16077 or something, um, to do this. Uh, and then you have the option to turn on containers in add or remove programs. You need containers and Hyper-V turned on. Before, if you did do um, Docker, it would use VirtualBox. So with the new tooling, it's moved over to Hyper-V. Um, and then that's what gives you this experience. And so this, this image, as you can probably tell, is running the Windows Server Nano operating system on top of Windows Client um, in a container. And so the same thing, oops. Um, we can do the same thing. And we can say hi to Ignite again. Um, and unfortunately, it will take a while again. I think they still have some performance issues to work out because, OK, it, it was a little faster that time. OK, so that's, that's basically how it works. I did want to show you some web apps running, but sadly, I could not get those to run, mainly because our images aren't quite all correctly done yet. So in absence of that, what I'll show you instead, for sure.
excellent question. So that's really what .NET standard is for. So it's much like PCL. So if you take by the, what you're encouraged to do is, if you're building class libraries, is to target .NET standard. And those, by their construction, will work on .NET Framework and .NET Core and Xamarin. So if you just start with .NET standard, then you'll be good to go. Does that help? Well, so meaning when you build libraries, you don't, you don't start out by saying, oh, I want it to be a .NET Core library. That, that's not the guidance. You're encouraged to target .NET standard and then only give up on .NET standard when there's some API that's only in .NET Core that you need to call, but there aren't very, very many of those. When we release .NET standard 2.0 um, for .NET Core early next year, um, then that'll almost never happen. So basically, just build portable libraries, and then they'll work in all the places you want them to. You still, yeah. Yeah, the, the takeaway is just most people will not build .NET Core libraries. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so this part's a little bit confusing. There's two different aspects that are both bad. Um, one is um, right now our, um, the thing that's a little bit confusing is .NET Standard and .NET Core are kind of somewhat inextricably linked. Um, so it's hard to tell a little bit when you're building a .NET Core class library and .NET Standard library. And our .NET Standard library tooling in Visual Studio isn't really the greatest. Um, so that's, that's being fixed. You can build .NET Standard libraries. See, let's, okay, let's see if we can just quickly resolve this one. And then I'll show you the Linux thing. Um, okay. So, new project. Um, yeah, not, not everything is, is quite perfect um, yet. So it says .NET Core Library. Let's go to the project.json and see what it says. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a .NET standard library. That's the part that's confusing about it. It's project.json. It, it, it says core, but it, this library actually has nothing to do with .NET Core. It uses .NET Core tooling to help you. But if you just stay with this, you're fundamentally not building a .NET Core library. You're building a .NET standard library that will work on .NET Core, Xamarin, and .NET Framework. Sure. Oh yeah, you know that works. So let's let's go let's 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 do that. So. There are some, this goes back to the project to project linking that I um, talked about earlier. Some scenarios don't work very well for that. So let's see. So if we do what you, what you would uh, reference is, what you would naturally want to do is add reference. Um, oh, thank you. Projects, yes. Class library one, click OK. Okay, uh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, so this must be, so this is basically the reason why we're moving to CS Proj. It's, oh, it's, oh, no, I, I know what it is. Um, yeah, um, what this is, is um, the unit of deployment for class libraries and these other core libraries is completely different. The .NET Core, slash .NET standard library, because it uses .NET Core tooling, it wants to produce a NuGet package as its unit of deployment. So what some people do is they have the class library for .NET Core produce a NuGet package, and then they reference that as, um, they reference the NuGet package instead of having a P2P reference. So ju just, for, just for clarity, that is not a good experience, um, and we don't think it is either. This part is basically not done yet. Um, that's what people do. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes. Sorry that it took me so long to understand that. OK. Don't have much time left. Let's switch over to Linux containers for people who care about that scenario. So it's, I think it's switched now. Uh, so Docker PS, there's no images loaded. So we're going to type very similar commands. Um, Docker images. I won't bother deleting it this time. Docker build minus T. That just, just says which tag I'm going to use. Uh, I do that all the time. Thank you. Um, and this time I just I don't have to specify the Docker file because I'm using the basic one. Yep, that worked. That was very fast. And then we're going to do Docker run ignite hello ignite. You can see that ran very fast. So that's the whole container story. You can see we don't have very good APIs right now to say which operating system it is. So all I did is just say what the app directory it is. So you can see that the slash goes the Linux way <laughs> in, this, in this particular example. That's, that was my hack. Um, but I, I personally think this is really exciting um, that um, Dyna Core and also Dyna Framework are kind of getting that container lifestyle. One of the things that one of the things that's kind of seen as the gold standard in um, the container world, at least in Linux, is supporting this distro called Alpine. Um, for those of you that know about those things, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. We don't yet support it, uh, but once we we do, we'll basically have Alpine on the Linux side and then Nano on the Windows side, and it means you'll be able to have very slim workloads, um, and you can either ship as your apps as self-contained or shared, whatever you want to do. OK, those were most of the demos I was wanting to go through. So let's, I don't have very much time left. So let's see if there's anything I was wanting to leave you with. Um, anyone have any questions? Uh, let me show you our roadmap. That's probably a good place to, oops, definitely don't want to do that. OK, so people often ask us what's coming next. So we talked about the MS Build and CS Prize support. So 1.1 one, one is near the end of the year. Um, we'll, the CLI will replat on top of MS Build. We will still have the CLI. The commands will be the same. We'll have CLI extensions for editing CS Prize from the command line, which is great for the VS Code scenario. Um, you won't need it in Visual Studio. Um, and we'll have improved usability uh, for Docker um, for both Windows and Linux, because uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, looking a little further out, um, we'll have done in standard 2.0 will land, so we'll get a lot more APIs. It'll be much easier to take an existing app and move those assets to .NET Core. C Sharp 7 will land. We've been very public with um, what's coming in that. Uh, so that's exciting. A really cool story is global commands. So the idea is with the .NET tooling, you'd be able to type .NET um, commands install and then name a NuGet package. And then that would come down your, to your machine. And then you'd have a tool available to you. And so it's kind of like a very extensible tools story. Um, we'll have more compact standalone apps. So right now, our, the apps that we produce um, are not nearly as compact as they could be. And so size is definitely a concern for a lot of people. So that's something we're working on. A better offline experience for development. Um, and last, um, will be usable on more Linux distros. It's a good segue to this slide. These are the OSs that we support today. Um, we've pretty much got what you would expect on the Windows side. Um, and then these are all the Linux distros. And we basically just mostly support the bleeding edge of the, the Mac ecosystem. Sure. Um, going back to the next slide. The, oops, one more. OK. Yeah, basically, the way to, to decode Microsoft releases is just figure out what's the next conference. Um, coming up, 
Um, so we have connect in November, uh, and then we have build in the spring. So um, you can kind of start to sort that out. Um, but yeah, we, we pretty much all of our dates align with conferences. It's, it's a good plan. Okay, well, um, I had many more slides that we could talk about, but I think now is pro this is probably a good slide to stop on to um, see if there are any more questions um, about the, the product and about the roadmap. Uh, hand over there in the white shirt or green shirt. Yeah, you. Sure, I get that question all the time. So, the, the extremely short answer is um, we don't have a project per se to um, replace Mono. That being said, um, even before they were acquired, they have been ingesting massive amounts of our open source code into their product. Um, that's mostly at the class library layer. So the, the Mono class library is looking more and more like the .NET Framework library every day. On the runtime side of things, um, we don't currently have any plans, mainly because you know, we're focused on the server scenario and they're focused on the client. And also, um, we're for focused on the server operating systems and they support the mobile ones, so they have Android and iOS. So, we're kind of fairly bifurcated in what we do. I'm sure in the long term, we'll end up with one thing, but like no one in our management is really asking us to pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, yeah? Sure, uh, that's an excellent question. So. One thing, if you were paying really close attention to that um, slide I showed on Age of Ascents, um, it actually showed, it made it look like ASP.NET Core on um, .NET Framework wasn't that great. And the reason is, is because the, the folks there just stopped measuring that particular one. I would imagine like 75, 80% of the benefits that you would see with um, ASP.NET Core on .NET Core on Windows would be applicable to .NET Framework. It's like when I actually have been sending mail to my team back in Redmond, um, asking them to run those exact numbers because I actually haven't seen them recently. Um, because it should absolutely be the case that you should get most of the benefit on .NET Framework. And if that isn't the case today, then we have work to do to go um, close out that gap. So. Um, ASP.NET Core on .NET Framework is absolutely a supported and an encouraged scenario. It makes sense for a lot of reasons, uh, and it's our job to make sure the perf is, is very close. When, when you go to the actual Second Tower website and look at the 13 preview files, what is that So the one thing I said is um, right now we're focused on the plain text. Yeah, it's, it's looking at the plain text. So actually, I haven't seen that yet. So you're saying that the the new one is already out, and they have. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I'd love to look at that. I I know that we got access to their. Um, the way it usually works is they do kind of a first run, and then they give the numbers to um, the various you know, companies slash teams. So they get an opportunity to kind of fix the numbers, blah, blah, blah. So I know that happened. The thing I'd heard is that we were still in a pretty good place. Um, so I, I guess I'm unable to answer your question with, for lack of context. But I asked this exact question, I think, last week. And I was told that things were still good. So that's all I know. I will go look at the website afterwards. Yeah. Uh, excellent question. So we kind of have a federated model at Microsoft. So like the directory services um, components are owned by some other team. So we do work with them. Um, 
I know, I think we have talked to that particular team. I know a bunch of them are trying to make those available, but I don't know any dates on any of those components. It's similar, like, not all of the Azure services are supported yet, and we're working closely with all of them to make sure that those are all supported too. So they'll all kind of fault in at different times. Is there any sort of website that has, like, an upcoming? Uh, that would be good, <laughs> um, but no, there isn't. Um, uh, if there's specific libraries that people care about for upcoming deployments, you can give me your information and I can find out. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What is the relationship on the Mac? No worries. Between the uh, .NET Core and Homebrew. Uh, Homebrew. So yeah, you can bring, you can bring AS, uh, .NET Core down through Homebrew or through our PKG. Oh, okay. It's just it, the yeah, it's, it's, yeah, just a different deployment experience. No, no, homebrew and NuGet are totally different things. So, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone.